Hello, everyone. It looks like we're on air now. I'm so sorry for the delay and appreciate your patience. And thank you all so much for joining this discussion on the initiatic process in ancient Egypt. Some of the things that we'll be discussing today are what is known about the initiatory process in ancient times, some of our more modern experiences, and how we can apply this in our own lives. The initiatory process in ancient Egypt is a fascinating topic. And it's interesting because it's difficult to know all the details of this initiatic process. First of all, all the candidates were required to take an oath of secrecy. So they promised not to say anything about this initiatic process. Also, not a lot of texts have survived to today that include, for example, the rituals that were used. In addition, the first individuals who found and interpreted the text and the tombs and the ritual objects were influenced by the culture of their day, just like we are today. So for those who, for example, discovered certain objects during the Victorian period, of course they're going to be influenced by that culture. And in some cases, their bias greatly influenced the interpretation that they made of what they found. For example, a text called the, most commonly called, the Book of the Dead was named that because archaeologists and Egyptologists discovered these texts in tombs. So they assumed that it had something to do with the dead. And their interpretation of this mystical text was that it was an allegory of what might happen to the pharaoh after the pharaoh died. But as it turns out, there's another interpretation that could be made including the translation of the name of this book. The literal translation of this text is the coming forth by day, which is clearly very different from the Book of the Dead. And when interpreted from a mystical or spiritual perspective, we could see that it's more about being reborn, more about an initiation or transformation than it is about an allegorical death. In fact, it took some very courageous Egyptologists to change our perspective, or at least the perspective of the public, on this topic. And one of those Egyptologists was a Rosicrucian member named Max Guimont. He was a Belgian Egyptologist, and Ralph Lewis, who was the imperator of the Rosicrucian order at that time, asked him to present his findings on the mystical aspects of the Book of the Dead, or the Book of the Coming Forth by Light, to prepare a booklet called The Initiatory Process in Ancient Egypt. So Max Gimel presented this information. And this was a very fresh perspective on an interpretation of this text. I'm going to read a short excerpt from Max Gimo's um, text. He says, first of all, we must know whether or not secret initiations were conducted in Egypt, especially in Abydos. In this regard, an ancient text dating back to around 2000 BCE, quite unknown up till now, seems to give an affirmative answer. Here is the, the text. To follow the god to his abode, in his tomb, Anubis sacrifices the hidden mystery of Osiris. 
in the valley of the master of life, it is the mysterious initiation of the master of Abydos. Max Gimo writes, what could be plainer? The god Anubis, the jackal of the necropolises, participated in the folding of a mysterious initiation conducted by Osiris, the master of Abydos. Therefore, it is toward this holy place that one must walk in order to conceive with the help of Egyptian texts of various states and sources how the initiatory process unfolded in the time of the pharaohs. There are also a number of ritualistic objects that have been discovered and in fact many are in the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum that shows uh, different objects that the ancient e Egyptians used during their mystical ceremonies. Now, Egyptologists, even today, are hesitant to state that there were mystical ceremonies, that there, were, that there was a spiritual transformation that took place in the oldest periods of ancient Egyptian history. But many agree that thousands of years later, during the tradition of Isis, which was actually a Roman tradition, the Romans, once they had conquered Egypt, really became uh, very engaged with the, the uh, tradition of Isis. And at that time, the initiations are more or less confirmed by Egyptologists. These rituals are described in detail by two ancient writers. The first is Epileus, and he wrote in his book that's called Metamorphosis, or the Golden Ass, many details about the initiation into the Isis tradition. So we know about the initiations that took place at that time. We do have the text. It's described in detail. And it's a story of feeling a closeness with the divine, in this case with the deity Isis, who in earlier times was the secondary figure among the Egyptian gods and goddesses, but by the time of the Romans, in the later history, she was the queen of the universe. She made the heavens move. She was so important. And the character in this book, Metamorphosis, or The Golden Ass, was able to feel a close connection with her. Times were very challenging in ancient Egypt. And here was a goddess who cared so much about the character in the novel, Lucius, that she helped him with his transformation. She personally cared about him. So this certainly engendered a feeling of connection with the divine. Another ancient writer who wrote about the ancient Egyptian mysteries was Iamblichus, and he described them in detail in his book on the Egyptian mysteries. So we have details about what took place in these ancient rituals. And these have been perpetuated, in some cases more, uh, in some cases less, uh, in certain traditions. The Rosicrucian initiations that take place in lodges around the world are based on what is known about the ancient Egyptian rituals. This includes having a guardian and a conductor who guides and protects the candidates and the different ritual officers who serve to help this person with their initiation. And again, the interpretation of this is not that it was only the pharaoh who was having, who, whose uh, uh, experience after death was being described allegorically, but it was actually the candidates who were prepared in the mystery schools. The mystery schools were called houses of life, and they included a temple, and they included a place where the candidates were prepared uh, through lessons and meditations. It included a ritualistic lake for purification. 
and the candidates there would prepare themselves in various ways. For example, at the Temple of um, Healing at Komombo in Egypt, if you go there today, you can still see that there is an underground tunnel. Now this tunnel is no longer open for people to enter, but uh, the first time I visited Egypt, we were allowed to go into this, this um, underground tunnel. And it's, it's, you have to bend over. It's not tall enough to stand up in. And it's um, just about wide enough that, and that tunnel in ancient times was filled with crocodiles. And the candidates were prepared for their initiation by being so calm, so tranquil, that they could go through this underground tunnel filled with crocodiles and come out the other end alive. This was their, their test. Now, I had a, uh, an idea of just what that might take when I saw two of these mummified crocodiles in the Cairo Museum. And I stepped off how long they are just to get an idea of, of how big these mummified crocodiles are and they're both 25 feet long and this underground chamber would have been filled with these crocodiles and the candidate would have to be so steady so centered that the candidate could go through this underground tunnel which is about uh, maybe about 40 feet long and come on the other end so this was one of the ways that they prepared for their initiation we also know that the, some of the rituals were open to the public, like a, a, a general festival. And these would take place in the outer courtyard. So even people who were not preparing as a, a candidate could go to the outer portal or the, to the outer courtyard. But then as you moved farther into the temple, fewer and fewer people were allowed inside. So the next level would be the neophyte candidates. Then as you go farther into the temple, the candidates who were prepared even more for the initiation. And only the highest initiates would be allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, where the final initiation would take place. This is um, something that continues today in Rosicrucian initiations where um, we have a proneos which is in front of the temple where new members hear, uh, they, they're allowed to listen to what takes place inside the temple and then we're initiated into the temple. The, um, the initiations that, the modern Rosicrucian initiations have been uh, conferred for the last 85 years in Egypt. And the first Rosicrucianic journey to Egypt took place in 1929. H. Spencer Lewis led a group of Rosicrucians from the United States, Canada, South America, and Europe, 75 members. He led them to Egypt for an initiation. And like today, the initiation wasn't just a one-day event. It took place over the course of their journey. Their journey took two months because they didn't have, uh, they weren't able to fly to Europe or to Egypt. And they stopped at mystical sites along the way. Yeah. And this continues today with Rosicrucian initiatic journeys to Egypt where we do fly directly to Egypt and then the initiation takes place over a two-week period all along temples or in temples all along the Nile and it like when it was with H. Spencer Lewis by our imperator Christian Bernard and so the initiations are ways of understanding the energies of the different places that we visit. 
And this process opens us up to other ways of knowing. So we're not just um, reading the text. We're not just um, learning about what may have happened to ancient Egyptians or to ancient candidates. We're actually uh, attuning with and walking in the footsteps of candidates who have participated in the initiations before, and we're participating in them today. So the initiation begins along the Nile and moves up the Nile and concludes with, um, with some initiations uh, near, the, near and around the Giza Plateau. Now like the candidates and the initiators of old, I can't share the details of what happens there, but in my experience, every candidate experiences something that is a uh, very profound and deeply transformational. And this is all in the same tradition as the initiatory process in ancient Egypt where we experience trials and tests and we overcome them and we get beyond intellectual ways of knowing and we experience uh, the transformation that was meant for us personally. Now I mentioned that the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum has some artifacts that were used in ancient rituals and initiations. And these include an incense burner that it's a, it's a long arm and on the end of the arm is a hand and the incense would have been placed in a cup on that hand. For the ancient Egyptians, incense was the, the fragrance of the divine in their presence. So it was a way of feeling a closeness with the divine. And this particular incense burner is used as an offering. It's, it's a hand offering. And it's a way of, of feeling a connection with the divine. We also have at the Rosicrucian Egyptian Museum a, um, a stone carving that shows the Pharaoh Akhenaten using an incense burner exactly like this in his temple. Speaking of Akhenaten, we, we have a ring that Akhenaten wore himself, uh, at least at some point. It has uh, his cartouche from early in his reign, and either he wore this ring during his lifetime and, and continued to wear it, or sometimes Akhenaten and other pharaohs would have a ring like this created in order to give it to someone who had been especially supportive. But in any case, this ring had at some point been in the possession of the pharaoh Akhenaten. We also have a very beautiful and rare statue of the goddess Sekhmet. And for those of you who have participated in the Rosicrucian initiatic journey in Egypt, you know that Sekhmet is extremely important in that journey and there is a, a special chapel in Egypt that we're allowed to uh, experience the healing energy of Sekhmet. The, when they could be considered most polytheistic, they still understood that there was an energy or a spirit that existed beyond all manifestation. And during all periods of ancient Egyptian history, they didn't really try to define that energy. For Akhenaten, he saw this as um, what's called the Aten, and he used the sun to symbolize this all-powerful deity that exists beyond all manifestation. But he didn't think that the sun was that deity. And even, again, during times when Many different deities were worshipped. Let's say um, uh, Isis and Osiris and Horus and Hathor. All of these deities were really aspects of the divine. The ancient Egyptians called them netchers, spelled N-T-R. The Egyptians didn't use vowels, and uh, this was was um, pronounced. These aspects, when the Egyptologists 
translated the word nature. They called them gods and goddesses. But really, in all these cases, they are aspects. And just like if you shine a light into a prism, the light comes out in different aspects or facets. In that same way, when the divine shoots forth its radiance, it's manifested in different aspects. And this might be an aspect of um, a healing aspect or courage, or um, for example with Hattor, the, the cow-eared and, um, and horned goddess. She is the, the aspect of joy and happiness and beauty and love and music and dance and everything associated with that. So sometimes with our modern perspectives, we will think, oh, they were worshiping a cow or a bird or a crocodile. But in order to make some of these concepts closer to the people and easier to grasp, they would be symbolized by one of these deities. For example, uh, a beautiful goddess or a fierce looking crocodile or uh, a strong and courageous falcon. So the ancient Egyptians, sometimes it's, it may seem like their beliefs were rather primitive, but actually they had a, a rather sophisticated belief system, including what would happen to uh, our soul after our body was no longer needed, after, our, after, uh, after we died. And so they, would, they knew that there was an aspect of ourself that would continue on after the death of our body. And they were preparing for that. It's really the basis for the motion that this, this aspect of the soul that could live on on this plane would have a place to go. So the, um, the ancient Egyptians had really a very interesting perspective. No matter how we interpret what we know about them today, it can, when we approach what is known about ancient Egypt from mystical or spiritual perspective, we can see that there is a um, really educated belief system, that they understood their connection with something greater than themselves that they felt this connection. In their everyday actions, they would be aware of a concept that is called mat. And this concept means order, or harmony, or balance. And everything they did was to keep balance in their life. Mat is represented by a deity, by a goddess, who has her arms spread out with wings below that. And she would keep harmony uh, in all the temples. All of the uh, priests and priestesses who took care of things in the temples, they were, even though their temple might be dedicated to a deity of healing or to a, heal, to a deity uh, of courage, their job really was to maintain mat or order, as in the opposite of chaos. So they, they would maintain this balance. Those are Crucians do when, when we're in our temples, making sure that we keep the energy. The ancient Egyptians understood the power of balancing positive and negative energy. And by positive and negative, I don't mean good or bad, but these are two aspects of, um, of a polarity. So there are images in the temples that show people being healed or people being given extraordinary power by having uh, deities on each side of them, often with their hands not touching their head, but next to their head like this, balancing their energies. And this was an important part of the initiations 
including what took place at Abydos, the location that uh, Max Guimau, our Rosicrucian Egyptologist, was talking about. So the, um, in Rosicrucian healing, we learn that all healing takes place by balancing our energy. And if we're not well, or if a disease manifests, it's because our positive or negative energy is out of balance. We may have too much positive or too much negative energy. And so we would balance this energy today by using very specific techniques in the Rosicrucian lessons to, to rebalance our energy. And the ancient Egyptians understood this. For us today, we would intone certain vowel sounds that either uh, stimulate the positive or the negative energy, thus balancing it. And we would uh, we can stand in a certain position, for example, with our arms straight out at the sides when we want to uh, gather more positive energy. And so the ancient Egyptians knew this in their mystical practices and their images that if you know what to look for and if you interpret them from a mystical or a spiritual or a shamanic perspective you can see that this is what they were doing. So um, at this point we're going to see if there are any questions and Let's see here. Okay, so um, so one of the questions is, what is what are the benefits of the initiatory process of ancient Egypt? And these lead to three areas. First of all, an understanding of natural laws so that we can live in harmony with them. And second, that we know ourselves better. And third, that we feel this connection with the divine. So regarding understanding natural law so that we can live in harmony with them, the example that I just mentioned regarding Mott is, um, or what I just mentioned regarding Mott is an example of that. That if we understand the natural law of balancing energy, then we can live in harmony with that. If we need to have more positive or more negative energy. Regarding knowing ourselves better, I think a perfect example of that is the example of um, the candidates who are required to uh, crawl through an underground tunnel with crocodiles. Certainly you would uh, have to know yourself very well before taking that on and you would know yourself well after completing it as well. And then engendering a feeling of connection with the divine or the great mystery. This is the goal of the initiations with Isis. In the story that I mentioned earlier, the, um, uh, the golden ass or metamorphosis, the main character, Lucius, he had accidentally turned himself into a donkey or an ass through the misuse of magic. And he has this dream where, well, first of all, he, he tries all these things to turn himself back into a human being, and he's never successful. And then he has this dream where he experiences Isis. And he experiences the initiation, and he dedicates his life to Isis because he realizes, as he said, that the divine cares about all of us, including an individual who was so foolish as to turn himself into an ass by misusing magic. And if she cared about him, certainly the divine would care about and help all of us. So it's this feeling of connection with something greater than ourselves. So I think we'll stop our hangout at this point. And I'd like to thank you all so much for joining us. And uh, until the next time. Thank you.